Today is our first brew day in the Home Brewer Pro course. I think you're gonna dig it. I have decided to kick us off using my favorite system and my favorite recipe as well. So uh, I'm gonna give you an overview of the equipment. I'm gonna give you the full recipe and uh, how you could do this on your own. Today we're using the Claw Hammer Supply Brew in a Basket. So if you've seen online, Biab, B-I-A-B, that stands for brew in a bag. Um, this particular setup uses a basket instead of a bag. So obviously you're gonna see that in action. This is the bigger system that works on 220 volts. Uh, they also have a 110 version. I'll give you the overview of the differences um, after this or while we're waiting for this to come up to a boil. So you'll get to see both in action. Um, this also makes 10 gallons instead of uh, five gallon batches. I don't think you would wanna do the 10 gallon batches on the 110. It would just take super long. So this beast has the 220 and uh, I absolutely love it. I think you're going to as well. So let's get right into it. We're gonna go into the recipe and I'm gonna show you exactly how I started brewing and actually what I do quite frequently. So um, I order my grain kits from morebeer.com. It's simple, it's easy, everything's already in the kit. You get your hops, you get the clarifier, um, you can order yeast right on there, and uh, you get all the grains. You get to pick if they're gonna be milled or unmilled. I get mine unmilled, and uh, so yeah, let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so here we go. Like I told you, this is my favorite setup and my favorite um, recipe of all times and I think you're gonna dig it too. If you have not heard of the world's most famous IPA, Pliny the Elder, uh, you're missing out, because this is an amazing beer. Vinny Chalurzo, the brewer at Russian River, was kind enough to give the recipe to us home brewers, and uh, more beer actually made a kit out of it. So this is exactly how it comes. I have two, so this is two set of, because we're making uh, 10 gallons today. Um, normally, if you were doing a five gallon batch, you would just do that. So, um, I've got two. As you can see, it includes uh, the hops. These are the specialty grains. There's uh, sugar in this particular recipe if there's any other specialty stuff like uh, oak chips, uh, you know, whatever it is, it comes right in these kits. So, everything is there for you. Measured out, you're good to go. Um, and this is what the instructions look like. And so this is actually gonna walk you through an actual brew day. I'll be doing that for you, so we don't need that. Um, but all of the details for the beer are right on here. So this is pretty amazing. That's why I like this so much. So as you get further along in your brewing journey, you absolutely will start to write your own recipes. You can tweak things. Uh, I, like I said in the instructional video, go through and brew like five, 10, 15 batches using kits like these. Um, it takes all the guesswork out. You get used to what the different grains are gonna behave like. Um, you'll get to know your system, the efficiency, how to use it, so that that becomes a no-brainer. And uh, you know, just do yourself a favor, pull the easy card, right? So here we go. So let's go over the setup real quick, okay? So the claw hammer supply, um, brew in a basket. Uh, like I said, I love the system. I've brewed hundreds of batches on the smaller version, so five gallon batches. Um, and then recently bumped up to the 220 because here in this brewery, uh, I had access to it. So if you have access to 220, I highly recommend going for it. Also, you can have either an electrician or um, somebody make an extension cord and then just adapt it to whatever your uh, washer and dryer plug is and make that long enough for you to brew, you know, outside or whatever. So um, these are awesome systems. It's a single vessel, all-in-one, electric. Um, these, they're, they're great. I can't speak enough about it. So this comes with, and you'll see all this in action in a minute. Um, it comes with the kettle, obviously, um, a pump for recirculating. This is a wort chiller, so that's how we're gonna get it cool before it goes into the fermenters. Um, the hoses you need, these are uh, for adding hops uh, while we're in there. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty much the system. And then 
Instead of a bag, like I said, brew in a bag is, uh, is, is very common. This system uses brew in a basket. So this is what the basket looks like. So, um, other equipment that you're gonna use. Um, I have a hydrometer. I have the bowls and the scale for our hop additions for measuring that out. Um, these are water adjustment salts. Some people call them uh, salts. So I, don't, I, I call them salts. So to know what salts to add uh, into the reverse osmosis water or to adjust for your city water, um, I put the recipe that this comes with, that this recipe kit comes with, into the Brewfather app. You can also use uh, Beersmith. There's a couple other calculators. Uh, Brew and Water is another fantastic spreadsheet that does all this for you. Essentially, you're gonna say, hey, I'm starting with reverse osmosis, or you have your water profile, and I want it to be a hoppy profile, so it'll give you what salts to add. So you don't need to be a chemist. I will say, if your neighbor walks in on you while you're measuring out white powders uh, with a jeweler's scale, Good luck trying to convince them you're not a drug dealer. Uh, ask me how I don't. So, we are gonna get started. Uh, step one, now that I've got all my tools in the right place, uh, I'm gonna kinda clean this up and we will be right back. We need to mill our grains to mash in. Okay, so the first step in getting this recipe going uh, was to turn the hot water on. Uh, the controller over here is extremely simple. You turn it on, uh, you've got a temperature probe that goes into a thermo well, and you tell it exactly what temperature you want it to be at. On the recipe for the Pliny the Elder kit, it recommends 151 degree mash. So that is what we set, turned it on. It took about 35 minutes uh, for us to get up to mash temperature, which is blazing fast compared to some other systems. Um, and uh, so here we go. So this water is warm. I'm gonna put the basket in and then I'm gonna make our uh, chemical adjustments to the water. So these, this is calcium chloride, gypsum, and Epsom salt. These are the recommended amounts that the Brewfather app gave me. And you can scroll down and once you get to the water section, uh, you just tell it, this is the profile that I start with, this is the profile that I want, and it spits out the numbers. There you go. So then you measure those out, and so we're gonna add those right now. Just that easy. Now, the brewer's favorite tool, the trusty paddle. Give it a stir. Actually, what's gonna give this a fantastic stir is us just dropping the actual basket in. Uh, so we're gonna do that. Inside this kettle, if you look down inside, there's the heating element that comes in, and then there's also a, uh, an inline filter on the back side of this port right here. So that's gonna help screen out any big chunkies or whatever uh, as we recirculate. Okay, so uh, we need to mill our grains. There is a pretty big grain bill for this. Um, one of the reasons I love this system is because you do uh, no sparge, which means you start with your full volume of water, you put all of your ingredients into the kettle, and it's big enough to handle that. The other option is to do the, you add the grains and a lower amount of water, and then you top that off at the end. And so um, I have always just done it this way. I'm used to it and uh, it helps me really dial in that water chemistry, or not the water chemistry, but the, the calculations for what my final alcohol content and all of those things will be because I know the efficiency of the system and uh, I, can, I can replicate recipes because in my notes that I take, I can always say like, this is how much water I used last time and it just makes it very repeatable. So um, that's uh, a good reason why I like this system. Let's get to milling.
care of pills. Lots of two row. Normally I do this on the ground, but we're recording, so you get the super awkward version of it. This mill is a monster mill. It is a three roller, um, and uh, I just attach it to this. There's motors that you can connect onto them, but I've been unsuccessful convincing my wife to let me buy the motor for it. They're a couple hundred bucks if I remember right. So um, through this little stand together, but the, they usually come with like, a disc of wood mounted underneath these that you just set right on top of the bucket. It tends to be a very messy, uh, dusty process. So um, I should be doing this outside, but I wanna show you what it looks like. So uh, you get the benefit of the doubt. So that's what that looks like. I'm gonna go ahead and finish this uh, outside so we don't create a huge dust bomb. Be right back. Okay, so here we are. I'm gonna talk you through how this recipe kit happens. So you just watched me mill. I'm actually gonna put the rest of the grains in here so we can start with the mash. Um, again, the basket is in here. We milled the grains, we put them all in here. And then we're gonna recirculate with a pump uh, to let all of those uh, starches, sugars, all of the fermentables to be extracted from the grains as that happens. So um, let me show you what that looks like. After we mill, the grain comes out and it's fine. The micron level of these baskets, so the filtration level that they can achieve, makes me able to grind finer. Um, because it's not gonna get stuck in here. If there's, you're gonna see other brewing systems uh, that I'll show you that have a false bottom, which is essentially a steel um, or aluminum uh, slab with cuts or holes basically drilled into it. So uh, you rely more on the grain to kind of filter itself. And uh, both are fine. Actually with a false bottom, you usually get higher efficiency than a system like this. But um, yeah, as long as I'm milling fine, I get uh, good extraction and efficiency in like 68 to 70% brew, brew, brew house efficiency. Okay, so to mash in, there's no secret here. Uh, you just dump it in and then we're gonna stir it up, make sure we don't have any clumps or dough balls that they're called. And uh, then I'm gonna hook up the pump and I'll walk you through the rest of the recipe and how to read one of these uh, recipe kit instructions. Easy peasy. Oh, I can already smell it. This is such a fantastic part of brewing, is the, the smells around it. It's just like that. Make sure there's no dough balls. We will stir this in about 20 minutes. I'm gonna mash for one hour. Um, that's kind of the rule of thumb uh, that everybody really sticks to. You can get away with a lot less. The guys over Brewlosophy are doing a series called Short and Shoddy, 30 minute mashes, and the extraction is not that much, um, or that the efficiency is uh, comparable. So to counter the time, you can just add an extra pound of grain or whatever, so because that costs like $2, so. Um, here we go, this recipe, this, uh, I, again, I'm doubling it. So this recipe originally calls for 13 pounds of two row malt. I'm doubling it. So two kits, that's 26 pounds of two row, uh, two pounds of carapels and six ounces of crystal 40 for the five gallon batch. So uh, that'll be 12 ounces. These come separately, the specialty grains. And so I'm gonna go ahead and put these in the mash as well.
I'm gonna go over all of the different kinds of grains with you in a separate video. Uh, but in short, two row is the base malt that most uh, ales start with. There's other varieties, but two row is, uh, is pretty much the body of the whole beer. You could do a beer with just that. Give this a quick stir. This recipe is actually really cool, so I'm gonna show you the hops here in a second. But we have uh, hops that are actually gonna go into the mash. That's not very common. Um, but I'm gonna trust Mr. Chilurzo because Pliny's freaking amazing. So let me go over this before I add that and then hook up the pump. Um, I'm just gonna read through these, uh, these hops and again, we're doubling everything, so bear with me here. So uh, for a 10 gallon batch, we're gonna have four ounces of whole cone cascade. That's what these guys look like. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Uh, Magnum at the very start of the boil. So that's actually gonna be a 90 minute boil. That's gonna add all of the bitterness. So a good IPA has that uh, piney, the, the bitterness that just makes a IPA an IPA. So that's where that comes from. And then throughout the boil, these, the, the way that these recipes are written, it's, uh, you think about it in reverse. So here it says two ounces of Magnum at uh, boil for 90 minutes. So that means um, that's the whole length of the boil. The next line down is add your Simcoe at 45 minutes. So it's not 90 minutes and then 45 minutes. Think of it as a 90 minute uh, clock and you're subtracting from that. So as we go through, I'll show you what that means, but essentially 90 minutes is total. And so when it says 45 minutes, you put it in when you've got 45 minutes remaining. Timers are your best friend, trust me. Okay, um, Magnum, Simcoe, Columbus, Centennial, uh, those are all gonna go in during the boil. And then there's also a monster dry hop on this. So let's see, we've got uh, six ounces of Columbus, Two ounces of Centennial and two ounces of Simcoe are gonna go in for five days of dry hop. And uh, that is a huge charge. This is gonna be an aroma uh, feast. You're gonna love it. Okay, so uh, here we go. In the mash, that again, we're gonna let go for one hour, we're gonna be adding the whole cone hops. These kits are awesome. They're pre-packaged. As long as you keep these stored in the freezer or at least a refrigerator until your brew day, the quality is gonna be spot on. It tells you the alpha acid, so that's the, the potency of them essentially. And uh, it's measured out for you. So this says two ounces of whole cone. It's right on the bag. <laughs> You're really gonna like this. So this is what our whole cone hops are gonna look like. They're dried out and smashed. Uh, and I'll show you the pellet hops, which are more common for home brewing. The pellet hops are um, easier to work with. So fortunately, the whole cone, they're gonna go inside the basket, which means when it comes time to pull those out, they're just gonna come right out. They're not gonna clog your pump, do whatever else. So uh, it doesn't matter that they're whole cone. So let's put them right in. Oh, this smells so good. They should make car air fresheners with hop smell. Million dollar idea. No hops left behind. All right, so we're gonna give these a gentle stir. Like I said before, as a, uh, uh oh, we got some bind left on one of these guys. Take out the seeds and stems. Uh, whole volume brew in a bag is the simplest, in my opinion. Because you don't have to worry about calculating sparge water, topping things off. There's, there's no math other than what you get, uh, what you do when you first start. So, all right, these are pretty well incorporated. And 
Now it's time for us to get the pump set up so we can recirculate. That recirculation is gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna basically pull the water through the grains as we go, and that will help that extraction happen and uh, just get some more activity. So essentially the water's going through the grains, coming out the side of the basket, uh, through the port at the bottom, go through a pump, and then come right back up to the top. I'm gonna tie it into this nozzle right here. This is a Mr. Nozzle, so let me show you what that looks like when it's in action. Okay, so here we are. This is a magnetic drive pump that comes with the claw hammer supply. Uh, there is a ball valve on the side that I almost never use. Um, I have hooked everything up to for these to be quick connect. I very much like quick connect. Um, it makes exchange hose exchanges uh, very quick, and you can put it onto just about anything. So you'll see it on my um, plate chiller that we're going to use later. Those are quick connect. I've got an immersion chiller that's quick connect. Here's a uh, temperature probe that's gonna be in line with our recirculation pump. So that's quick connect. You can just put everything together. It, just, it makes perfect sense to me. I very much enjoy it and it makes cleanup, disassembly, all of that easy peasy. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and hook this up. Um, the uh, controller over here, the electronic controller for this actually has a plug for the pump which is very nice because it's got a button on the front to turn it on and off. Otherwise, you could just plug this directly into the wall. It's gonna work. So, uh, this won't turn on, I'm just plugging it in. Like so. And now I'm gonna move around to the front. So, for this we're gonna use two different hoses. One goes from the liquid out on the brewery into the pump in. Uh, this is in and this is the out. We will open this up before we start, but if I did that right now, it would start flowing through the pump. So you wanna make sure you're fully hooked up. Uh, I'm gonna go into the top of the spray nozzle and to the pump out. Now we can open this up and you're gonna see liquid start to flow. So I can already see it. We're gonna turn the pump on and it's gonna start recirculating. So I can hear it. Uh, you probably can't see that on the video, but when I lift this up, this is the spray nozzle in action. So that's just gonna do that for the hour, however long you wanna mash for it. The instructions on this one say one hour, so I'm gonna obey it. Um, and uh, we're gonna let that roll. The only exception to that hour is that I'm gonna stir it about every 20 minutes just to make sure that everything is kind of flowing right and doing its thing. So this is a hurry up and wait time, but in the meantime, I can go through the rest of the recipe with you. Okay, so you've seen the hop additions that we're gonna make. I've removed the dry hop packets so they don't confuse me as we go through. Uh, so all of our hop additions for the boil are right here. One of the things in this recipe is the uh, corn sugar. So essentially that's dextrose and that's gonna increase the alcohol content of this. And our target is about 7.8 to 8% uh, alcohol by volume for this batch. So that's where the sugar comes in. Uh, it's all spelled out right on the recipes. Uh, you can, it can't go wrong. The notes on the back are gonna tell you what to mash at. So the mash temperature, uh, like we'll talk about in a different video is is a pretty important part of the brewing process. So you want to maximize the extraction of the good fermentables and um, it's also gonna change the character of the beer, it can do that. So uh, we're gonna go over that in a different video, but for this particular recipe, 151, which is actually a pretty common uh, mash temperature, 151, 152 for ales. Uh, I frequently hang out at that time, or at that temperature. So the electronic controller actually has a PID um, in it. So as the temperature rises and drops, this temperature probe is gonna be talking constantly. So if it goes above, it kind of tunes it down. If it um, dips down two degrees, it's gonna turn that element back on to keep a consistent temperature. The alternative is to use a gas burner. And so the gas burner, you just, it's more manual. You just put a temperature probe in there. If you need to turn the fire on, you can do that. Um, there are other ways that are more complicated that have been around for a long time where people use like 
um, ice chests and you would go in at a certain temperature, say I wanted 151 for this, I would put it in, I would put the, get the water up to say 170 or 165, whatever that calculation is for uh, the temperature of the grains, how many grains there are, they drop the temperature to your target, you seal that thing up and just let it sit. So uh, those are the different ways. The most accurate, in my opinion, is electrical, PID, which is what this system uses. Okay, so right now we're mashing on the big system and I wanna take a minute to tell you about the differences between the two. In case you're wanting to get into the hobby, you will have a decision to make essentially. So if you want the claw hammer supplies, I've grown up bro brewing with these and I absolutely love them. I've made hundreds of batches on the five gallon system, recently moved up to the 220, like I said. So. Um, let me tell you about the differences. So essentially, these systems are identical. Um, the electric controller is obviously different. This one goes on 110 and it's a standard GFI plug. Comes with its test and reset on the side. Um, very safe, you could literally do this on your kitchen counter um, or in your backyard. Um, inside these kettles, where the magic happens, you have a heating element a inline filter that comes out on this, uh, on the, the output right here, and a thermo well, so that's where the temperature probe goes. The exact same thing is happening over here, it just has a much bigger element, um, and uh, yeah, really that's it. The, it just has a bigger element. I upgraded the inline filter to be longer than uh, the one that it comes with. Um, both systems have the exact same quick connect on the lid that then has a spray nozzle on the uh, bottom side and that's where we recirculate. So uh, in, in short, the brew day is this. You take the basket that it comes with it, heat your water up to the temperature that you wanna mash at. You put the basket in, put your grains in, um, into the basket, stir them up, Start the recirculation with the pump that this system comes with and just let it sit. I stir it every 20 minutes or so to maximize my efficiency, make sure that everything's flowing right, but you really don't have to. Um, and then once that is done, uh, you lift the basket out. For the big guy, I have a winch installed. Um, you really could just brew on the floor and kind of stand up and lift it out. Um, and the way that it hooks onto the edge of the, of the kettle is with these hooks, so there's three hooks. Really, the safest way is to use a winch um, or a second person to put these hooks in. I do it by myself, I always have, um, but I mean, do you, you know your body, so take care of it. Um, so you just lift this out. So this is gonna have the wet grains and they're gonna be dripping all of that liquid in. You just pop these guys in and then it's gonna sit there for like 10 or 15 minutes while it drains. I pop, uh, big gloves on and I just press down to get all that liquid out if I'm in a hurry. Otherwise, I set the temperature controller to come up to a boil and uh, it's coming up to a boil while this is draining and so you can be pretty efficient with your time. Um, yeah, as it's, uh, and then you take the spent grains, you can put them in the compost bin, you can feed them to your chickens or whatever. Uh, there's, there's a, you know, fun things to do with the grains, they usually end up in the green bin for me. So um, once it's drained, you just take this whole thing back out, remove the clips. Remember, it's coming up to a boil. So um, what I do and what they recommend is you put your hop spider in. This is the big one for, the, for this system. So the other one is a little bit shorter and it sits right on there. So when you put the lid on, the clips that are hanging over the side give you a little bit of a gap, so it's not gonna boil over. With the 110 system, um, it takes it a while to come up to a boil, and to control the boil vigor, you basically just figure out where to put the lid. So if I kept it over here, or I took it completely off, it's gonna be like a sub simmer, uh, depending on ambient temperature as well. But if I want a really vigorous boil, which I generally do, um, I'll close it most of the way like that, and with the hop spider arm sticking out, it just kind of stays propped up. You get really good boils on that, 
With this big system, you do not need to worry about it. You can take the lid off and uh, let the power rip at 100% and you're gonna get a vigorous boil. So um, that's pretty much the differences between the two systems. If you're making a decision, you gotta take into account what size batches you wanna do. You can get the five gallon batch size with 220. Um, I don't think you would wanna do 10 gallon batch size with 110 if that's an option, I can't remember. Um, it would just take you too long. It's taking like two hours to get up to temp. So uh, you've got to account for your space. So this is a perfect five gallon batch size, all in one. You could do it on your kitchen counter in an apartment. You don't need a bunch of room to pull this off. Uh, really same thing with this guy. It's just a matter of uh, how much your wife will let you uh, store in the hallway closet. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then for storage, these are awesome. I put the basket in, the controller, um, the clips, the temperature probe, all of it just lives inside so I can just pick it up, take it wherever I wanna go and uh, then go brew. So um, these are great systems. I hope this was informative for you. All right guys, so I am done with my mash. We've let it sit for an hour. I'm gonna check the pre-boil gravity um, and to do that, I have two different options. Um, basically, I wanna make sure that the sugars and starches did like convert and uh, that our wort is going to turn out the numbers that we want it to. So uh, right now I'm doing the Pliny the Elder kit from More Beer and um, the original gravity estimate is between 1070 and 1076, which is 1.070 or 1.076. Um, what that is essentially is the sugar content of the wort before the yeast turns that sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. So that is how we determine our alcohol content because we know what it started at and then we're gonna know what it ends at. And uh, with magic calculators, we can do that pretty easily. So our target here for a seven and a half to 8% beer, um, I will take uh, two samples. So. The, the two main tools that I have at my disposal here are a refractometer or a hydrometer. The, the hydrometer essentially is a weighted um, bobber, this is glass, and it's gonna float in the liquid. And the scale here is marked just right, the paper inside. And so the level that it floats at, that's gonna tell me what the gravity is. Um, and so that works that way. The, the downside with doing this right now uh, with this is because this is hot. This is supposed to be, this is calibrated to work at room temperature, so 70 degrees. Um, so I'm actually not gonna fill this up right now because the refractometer, I am just gonna put some work into a little bowl and then using a dropper, I'm gonna pull up a little bit. It's instantly gonna come down to whatever temperature this is. So let me show you how this works. They do the same thing. One just needs a lot less, or we're only gonna use like five drops. The other one you gotta fill up until here, it's gonna float, um, both work. Downside of the refractometer is you have to do math if you wanna use it on finished beer because alcohol changes the way the light refracts through it. So you can't do it on fermented beer unless you knew the numbers before and you're willing to use the calculator to do it. So uh, it's really not that big of a deal, but for finished beer, that's your guy. Okay, all right, so uh, let's do this. I'm gonna get some wort. We're still recirculating, so I'm gonna pull it right out of the um, spray nozzle here. And I don't need very much. That's it. And so here's this guy. Um, doesn't really need to sit and cool down to room temperature because like I said, a couple of drops isn't gonna move the needle uh, for the refract topper. So what you do um, you can calibrate these, you look through it and there's a scale um, on all of the sides. So bricks on one side and OG on the other and uh, that is the, or the standard gravity is, is on the other. So I use OG, most of the world uses bricks but true to form in America we break everything so that's why we use OG. All right, I'm going to take a small sample out of this, drop it directly onto this lens, close the window and look through it. 
into the light. Our target is between 1075 or 1070 and 1075. Right now, pre-boil, I am at 1060. Uh, during the boil, we're gonna be boiling off water, which is gonna concentrate the wort and all the sugars. So we are spot on for that range, 1070 to 1076 is what the uh, recipe kit um, uh, estimates. So we are spot on on the low side, but during the boil, we will be adding sugar. So that's actually gonna spike it up even more. Uh, I'm very happy with this. We're ready to mash out. Okay, so we have spent our hour of mash time. Uh, it has gone swimmingly. We know the gravity pre-boil is 1060. So let me show you what the process looks like. So the first step is to actually turn the pump off so that our recirculation stops. Otherwise, you're just gonna spray wort all over the place and that's a sticky mess. So I'm gonna reach over here, turn off our pump. So that's gonna stop. You're gonna see this back up into that. Um, I'm actually going to let that run down and then close the ball valve here. You can also close the output. It doesn't really matter, but I'm over here, so that's what I'm gonna do. Disconnect our spray valve. If you don't close this valve and this gets below the level of the liquid, gravity's gonna win and it's gonna make a big mess. So, um, this is smelling fantastic. Like I told you before, uh, this basket is very heavy, so I have set up my winch here I hope it doesn't rip out the uh, anchor in the ceiling that I did, and uh, we'll see if we get lucky. So, um, put the handle back on. For the for the smaller system, I keep the handle on, but for this one, for some reason, it just uh, it's slightly bigger, and so the lid doesn't close right. So I'm gonna hook that up. Get our pulley in line. I'm gonna slowly lift this out of the liquid. The water's gonna be falling out back into the kettle. Um, so if you just take your time, it's really not that hard. And then once it gets high enough, I'm gonna put the little clips on that I showed you. And that basket is gonna rest there. All the water and everything is gonna, or all the wort is gonna come out of the grains as, they, um, as they're suspended above the boil kettle. Another thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna turn our electric controller up to the boil temperature. So while this is draining, uh, it just makes it more efficient on the time. And so it's gonna be coming up to a boil as it's draining. So uh, here we go, let's do it. Got my clips. These grains are very heavy. And it just takes time and persistence to get this guy out. That is a gigantic grain bill, makes this basket rather heavy. Um, do what you gotta do. Like I said, if I was brewing this um, not on camera, I would keep this on a lower thing, like a coffee table height. That way I can stand above it and lift it like that. So the pulley did the work for us though, and uh, it hasn't ripped out of the ceiling yet, so let's hope we get lucky. So we're gonna let that go. I'm gonna come around and we're gonna change the temperature on the controller, bringing us up to a boil. Okay, so now that we've got the bag pulled out, um, like I said before, if I was doing this uh, normal, I would have it on a lower surface, so a coffee table height, so that I can stand over it and lift it. Somebody else can put the clips in, or I, I can muscle it on my own, but um, it's definitely hard. So for this, I had to climb up on the table, pull it out, because it uh, starts at waist high is what it is. Um, okay, so now that we've got the basket out, she is draining back into the kettle. Everything is working perfect. I'm gonna change the temperature and move us up to a boil, um, or tell the controller to move us up to a boil, and uh, we can do that while this is draining. So here we are. These, uh, these controllers are very intuitive. It's actually the exact same usability as the 110 system. 
So I already knew uh, how to use it when I got this. I was extremely pleased with that. So um, you just go up and activate the temperature, move over, boil is 212 degrees. So that's what I'm gonna set it to. This is set to 100% output. It's gonna be rather quick. So you're gonna watch these numbers go up. So uh, boom. There we go. And 212 set and you're gonna watch the heat light come on. Boom. She knows what temperature it's at and says, oh, okay, you want me to go up to 212? Turns it on. I already hear the element cooking, so uh, everything is working exactly as planned. So stay tuned, we'll watch these numbers rise. Okay, so we are now at a boil. Uh, impressively fast, I think it was only like 20 minutes. Um, so per the recipe, we are going to do our first hop addition. So this is the 90 minute hop addition. So this is at first boil. Um, we do have a nice vigorous boil going on. All we're gonna do is take our Magnum pellet hops and uh, show you what these look like. These are bittering hops. So they have, um, they're pretty strong. So that's what pellet hops look like. They're absolutely amazing as usual. My favorite part of brew day is smelling the hops up close. It's fantastic. Okay, so for these, the bittering hops, I'm gonna put them directly into the wort instead of using the um, mesh screens. Um, I don't know why, that's just what I've always done. It doesn't cause that much of a problem in the boil uh, volume wise because of how technically little it is. So. Um, but for all the other hops, I'm gonna do those in there. I just don't wanna like overfill these to where they're not getting the right flow and everything. So uh, these go straight in. Ooh, buddy, be happy. Double check, okay, yeah. <laughs> all right, and that's our first hop addition. I'm gonna put these guys in. Uh, and our next addition per the recipe is when there's 45 minutes left in the boil. So 90 to 45, uh, I set a timer for that difference, right? So 45 minutes, I set a timer for 45 minutes. See you then. All right, 45 minutes have gone by on the clock. Now we have our uh, 45 minute addition, which means these are going in and this is, uh, two ounces of Simcoe. I am gonna use the hot baskets this time. Um, you do not have to. It just helps keep the wort cleaner at the end. So making transfer into the fermenter, you're not gonna clog up your pump as easily. It just, it keeps things um, tidier. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna do this and then I'm gonna see you in 15 minutes for our 30 minute edition. That's all there is to it. Okay, so here we are. We're gonna add our last set of time tops. So the, the last set over here, those are gonna go at, at flame out. That means when we turn the, uh, in this case, the electric element off uh, right before we start cooling. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna make our last edition of Columbus and then I'm gonna set up the chiller so that it's ready for us uh, at flame out. I'm also gonna cycle some hot wort through it because it's boiling right now. It's, this is sanitized um, after every time that I brew, but I still like to run the hot wort through it. And so what's happening is that essentially with temperature, we're pasteurizing it. So um, it's safe, there's no microbes or anything growing in the beer uh, before you chill. So like we talked about in the sanitation video um, for cleaning, on the hot side, you don't really have to pay too much attention to, uh, you know, kind of bacteria or whatever, because it's all cooking out. But uh, as soon as you drop below um, 150, you really need to be paying attention to uh, sanitizing absolutely everything. So um, again, we I use PBW to soak everything and then star sand to sanitize everything before I use it. So you're gonna get to see me do that on the fermenter. Um, for this, I'm gonna sterilize the chiller using the boil that's already there. So we're gonna just cycle that through the pump and that's gonna be our, our final check on that. So um, 
We have the wort coming out of the front, coming to the input of the pump. These are marked wort in and wort out. What this is, this plate chiller, there is a bunch of layers going back and forth. And so it's basically making the wort go back and forth uh, until it comes out the other end. And in the opposite direction, we're running water. So it's two layers uh, up next to each other. So we're transferring heat out. So cold water coming in, it's uh, flowing in opposite directions. Um, and that is how we're gonna use this one. For smaller batches, five gallon batches, I use my immersion chiller. So the immersion chiller is pretty cool because uh, you don't have to worry about what's inside. You can see what's going on. Basically, it's water's gonna come in and cycle through and that's where the heat transfer is coming because it's ejecting that hot water out. So uh, copper heats that, or copper allows that transfer to happen well. So uh, I'll show you that on the next uh, video. So for now, we're gonna set this up. Everything is quick connect, it makes life so easy. Um, we're gonna go from the pump out to the wort in, okay? Everything is labeled. I made myself a little quick connect jumper for that to happen, and then we're gonna go from the wort out, so it's gonna come in here, come out here, and I'm gonna pump it right back into the kettle. So that is what this hose is gonna do. I run it through here just so I don't make a mess. Um, so that is the hot side, this is the wort side. Water and the wort are not gonna mix, they're in separate chambers. So um, now I'm gonna connect cold water, so I'm plumbed into the brewery and I use a quick connect for that. Um, a lot of folks just have a garden hose. You would attach a garden hose to one side and then a garden hose on the exit. So uh, one note on water consumption, you're gonna use a lot of water when you brew. So if you have a way of being water safe or water, sorry, water smart, um, do it. I've got a big, uh, the 55 gallon brute trash cans that I collect the runoff in. I use that for cleaning. We can use that for watering things. The kids play with it. You know, it just gives me, uh, makes me feel a little bit better about all the water that goes uh, out, basically out the down the drain if you're not collecting it. So uh, this is set up. I'm gonna catch you in about five minutes. We're gonna add the corn sugar and then get ready for our last flame out hop addition. We're also gonna put in our clarifier. So this is gonna help those proteins coagulate and drop to the bottom, um, allowing us to have clearer beer at the end. So those are the last few steps. I'll see you in about 15 minutes and we're gonna um, just about be done with this brew day. So see you soon. All right, so here we are. We've got five minutes left on the boil. Um, so I'm gonna be adding the corn sugar, the whirl flock, and then once we're ready, and I've cycled the um, wort plate chiller um, for about five minutes. So boiling wort has been going through it. It is super hot to the touch. Um, there's no boogers in there. It's good. So uh, remember, we did that to sterilize it. Um, wort flock. This is uh, it's essentially a blend of Irish moss, and it's going to help Proteins coagulate, like I said, um, it's gonna help with the ultimate clarity of the of the work. I got two of these because one came in each kit, but if you read the package, it says use half a tablet for a five gallon batch or a whole tablet for a 10 to 15 gallon batch. This is a 10 gallon batch, so we're just gonna use one. I uh, put the other one away. I'll just use it on a, on a different brew day. These, easy peasy, no magic. Okay. The corn sugar, we're gonna add directly to it. I don't want a clump of it to go down and sit on the heating element, so I'm gonna add it slowly while also stirring, so I need to get my mash paddle, and uh, you just add it. It's gonna dissolve instantly because this is super fine. So, you just go in, boil is still going. Yeah, it disappears like instantly, so. We're just gonna add one, stir up a little bit, I don't want this turning into caramel on my heating element down there. So really the wisest thing would be to do, to the wisest thing to do would be to turn the heating element off. I don't think that we need to do that today. So I've had about half the bag. I'm gonna give it a stir.
This spikes the alcohol content. That's what the sugar's for. It's more food for the yeast. All right. Bag number two. Happy and healthy. All right, she's in. Okay. Those are all nice and happy there. Our hot baskets, good, give them a little stir. Make sure everybody's happy. So, um, yeah, at flame out, flame out again for us just means electrical element off. Um, that is when we're gonna add these. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the pump. Um, get one couple last seconds of this guy uh, sanitizing, and then I'm going to kill the heating element, and then we're gonna add the hops. So essentially, these are going to impart aroma, flavor, very little bitterness, um, because we're gonna get the temperature of this down um, as fast as we can. So here we go. Pump on. That's flowing very vigorously. Um, this is a really good pump. And then we're gonna turn our heat off. So you can keep an eye on that temperature gauge and you're gonna see the drop is gonna be pretty quick. My hands are all steamy from the, from the steam. We've got Simcoe and Centennial going in for these. Centennial is uh, very citrus and uh, floral. Actually, same thing for um, Simcoe has got more of a piney uh, element to it. There's one. Bunch of hops. On a basket. It's okay. All right, and we're off. I'm gonna go turn the water on and it's gonna to start to recirculate uh, through this and uh, we're gonna watch that temperature drop really fast. There it goes. Increasing the surface area or getting movement around in there is also gonna help. My goal here isn't really to get it all the way down to uh, pitching temperature. I have glycol on the fermenter that I'm gonna be using for this so I'm just gonna get it under like 90 and let the glycol chiller take the rest. Um, and then I'll pitch it once uh, I'm down to pitching temperature. So around 68 or 70 degrees. That last addition of hops kind of stacked up on top of itself in these uh, hot baskets. So I'm just pushing them down inside there. Make sure I get all the deliciousness out of them before we're done here. So another thing I can do is just take this. And have it pour directly onto the hops in here. and all that good rinse onto them. Excellent. Temperature's dropping. Um, okay, 
I'll be back as soon as we're back at the uh, right temperature and I'll show you what it transferring that to the fermenter looks like. So as you can see, we are down under 100 degrees. Um, if you were direct pitching or you wanted to do that, you'd have to get it down under 80 or so. Um, but I'm not gonna worry about that. We have the uh, glycol cool stick in the X1 Uni by um, Brewbuilt. So you can pick these bad boys up at more beer. These are awesome. Um, so yeah, we're gonna do this. My pump is still running, but I have turned the water off. Um, so essentially, I'm going to just move this into the fermenter, but before I do that, we need to sanitize it. Um, so I'm gonna shut that off for now. Um, this is Star San, no rinse sanitizer in a spray bottle. I just cleaned all of the components for this. I did sanitize the, the jar at the bottom. So everything is clean. Uh, I'm just gonna give this a spritz, line everything on the inside, and then we're just gonna leave it. We put the wort in on top. All of our pieces. We're gonna open this up until I see some sanitizer drips. And coming from the bottom. So we're, we are dripping, so all of my surfaces inside are nice and clean. Close it back up. There's a butterfly valve down at the bottom of this. Um, so I can't get sanitizer in, so before I assemble the bottom, I had to sanitize that on its own, assemble it, and now I just did the top. Uh, so here we go. We're gonna transfer. I've been getting uh, some clogs on my screen, which is exactly what I should have expected was gonna happen uh, by putting hops directly in here. But as we saw, these guys kind of got clogged up with all of the hops that are in this recipe. So it's kind of like, which battle are you gonna fight? Um, I still think we made the right call. So now I'm gonna turn the pump back on. It is transferring in. I'm just gonna use my mash paddle to kind of scrape that filter clean um, so that it can continue to go vigorously. So, um, something we need to talk about. Um, in uh, big brewing, uh, we aerate the wort to give yeast all of the opportunity that it needs. So essentially the, the oxygen that you're forcing into the wort is helping, it'll help the cell walls of the yeast so that they can multiply and uh, do their thing. At the homebrew scale, I've never noticed any difference. So do it if you want to. Um, some people are like, oh, you gotta shake the carboy to get more oxygen in there, how many parts per million you can get doing that way. Um, it simply doesn't move the needle enough. So uh, what I do do is I'll just splash this wort into it. So the pump is basically forcing it and it's getting all frothy. That's doing the exact same thing. So um, I don't worry about oxygenating this with say a carb stone or there's, you know, there's one way of doing it with like a fish pump and it recirculates through a carb stone. It's just not something that I'm worried about, especially with the, uh, incredible yeast that we have access to these days. It's it's just not a thing. So, clearing that up. In my boil kettle, I just had, I had just under 11 gallons of wort, which is fantastic. So I'm gonna finish this transfer and then I'll be back in a minute. We're gonna talk about the gravity readings for this. So we can update our notes and we're gonna get to know what the final alcohol content we can expect out of this beer. See if we hit our numbers. See you in a bit. All right, so we got just a little bit left in the tank, uh, maybe half a gallon left. So I'm gonna manually lift this. The pump doesn't like pulling through uh, just because that spigot hole is a little bit, it's like a half inch off the bottom. So um, this smells and looks fantastic. All right, that's all we got. Final volume is uh, nine and a half gallons. That's a, that's good yield. Um, my assumption is there were just still like 
some uh, wort left in the grains, which is why we didn't get our full 10 gallon volume. Uh, and that boil was very vigorous. So, um, more boiled off than I would have expected. So, now we're gonna put the lid on. Like I said, I'm gonna come down to temperature with the glycol, so this isn't at pitching temperature yet. Uh, need to sanitize the lid. We've got a little nook here for the pressure release valve, and I wanna make sure that the sanitizer gets into that, and then uh, uh, this here, which is the blow off. Very well built systems, um, thick stainless steel, and uh, they should last longer than my liver does. All right, so we're gonna crank this down. These are actually pressure rated, so you can ferment and carbonate or do pressure fermentation uh, up to 15 pounds per square inch, so 15 PSI, that pressure relief valve will go. Um, this particular unit I got with the floating dip tube. So the floating dip tube actually is suspended by a floating ball right here. So when I'm racking the beer into the kegs, when I show you that, it's going to be floating from the top down, so I'm getting the cleanest beer the whole way through. So uh, this lid is on, we're going to drop the cool stick and dip tube down. So just like everything else on the cold side, sanitize it. My hands have been sanitized so I can touch these things and it's fine. And there she goes. So now this beer is, or this wort is uh, sealed up in here. In the morning, I'm gonna come out and pitch the yeast and uh, we will be at 68 degrees, which is exactly what the fermentation temperature this yeast uh, wants. So, um, I'll see you then. Okay, so we just got the Pliny into its fermenter. Uh, it's coming down to temperature so that we can pitch the yeast once that's uh, at the right temp. So right now, I pulled two different samples so I can show you we're gonna get gravity readings, and this is gonna tell us how much fermentable sugar is in the wort, which is how we are going to back into knowing um, how much alcohol content there is. So this is a hydrometer, a very classic tool. Um, they use it in winemaking, in distilling, and brewing. So um, there's pros and cons to both, but uh, yeah, I kind of use these interchangeably. I usually end up with the spectrometer more, but we're gonna do this anyway. So uh, basically you just put it into the vial, drop this down. I give it a spin just to kind of get things, if there's air bubbles or anything, if it's slightly carbonated, it's gonna knock those off. And then you're gonna look at the lines that are in there. And we are at a perfect 10, Oh, wow. We, uh, we were highly efficient on this. So my, I'm at 1080, so I'm above the alcohol, um, <laughs> the estimates. My assumption is that our boil was extra vigorous and, uh, and that burned off some extra water. Let's see if I'm getting the same number on the refractometer. Yep, spot on on this one too, 1080 uh, on the nose. So we got a little bit excited there. Uh, my assumption is just the, the boil was more vigorous and uh, 
so we burned off a little bit more water. We could do a couple of things. We could boil water and add it to the fermenter and get to the exact gravity numbers that we wanted, or we can let it rip and uh, instead of a 8% Pliny, now I've got an 8.5% Pliny or uh, pushing nine. So um, I'm gonna let it rip and uh, enjoy every single sip of it. So there you go. Now we got our gravities and uh, next time I see you, we're gonna pitch the yeast.